speakers in Africa and the Africa in diaspora. He is the founder of several organizations including the PLO Lumumba Foundation, a charitable organization that has been in operation since 1990. He has also been twice recognized as one of the top 100 most influential Africans. Let me start by recognizing our host, Imboni Hadebe. Let me also recognize that we are assembled here on the occasion of the sixth memorial lecture of Slabet. Steve Mbiza, and let me recognize your majesty, the good doctor, my very good friends who have had occasion to speak before me, and those who are present in this assembly to listen to us. In your absence, our speeches would mean little if not nothing. Let me say how glad I am to be present here to talk about a subject that is as topical as it is evergreen, the topic of decolonization of African culture to include Africa's religion and Africa's economy. I remember so very distinctly uh, several years ago when a young African stood up on the sixth day of March in 1957 on the occasion when his country regained independence a country then known as Gold Coast, which was then renamed Ghana. And he said on that day that the independence of Ghana meant nothing if Africa was not free. The question that we ask is whether Africa is indeed free beyond the flags that we made for ourselves. One year later, that young man stood up again in Accra, Ghana, in the presence of the freedom fighters of the African countries which were still under the colonial yoke, and reminded his audience that Africans had to free themselves. Two years later, in Casablanca, Morocco, that young man stood again and reminded his audience of the significance of freedom. Three years later, on the 24th day of May, in 1963, that young man stood again in the presence of 32 heads of states and governments of African countries that had regained their independence. On that day, he reminded his audience that their independence newly acquired would mean nothing if they were not united. That their independence would mean nothing if they did not decolonize their minds that their independence would mean nothing if they did not act with a sense of urgency to liberate Africa. He reminded his audience on that day that while in 1958 he had said, seek ye first the political kingdom and the rest will be given unto you, there was a sense of urgency 
in regaining our independence in all its dimensions. His audience listen to him not. And as I speak to you today, our continent is not at ease. Our continent is not at ease spiritually. Our continent is not at ease economically. Our continent is not at ease in our health. Our continent is not at ease in our education. We live in a continent which has great prospects, but is now in monumental difficulties. And that is why it is legitimate to engage in an inquiry such as this. We have been victimized many times and those who spoke before me had the occasion to narrate to you how we were enslaved and commodified by the Arabs. The Arab colonization project was a project not only of Islamization but also a project of Arabization. And when the Arabs were done with us, the European tribes came. If it was not the Portuguese, it was the Dutch. If it was not the Dutch, it was the Italians. If it was not the Italians, it was the French. If it was not the French, it was the Germans. If it was not the Germans, it was the English. We were victimized. That is our history. And when slavery had lost its luster, some from within their ranks pretended that they were abolishing slavery. They introduced yet another thing, the thing called colonization. They came into our continent and claimed that they had discovered us they came, and while we were here, they discovered the Cape of Good Hope. They discovered us, they claimed. While we were here, they came and pretended to discover all lakes and all rivers. That is how they came. While we were here, they came and pretended that we had no history. But let us assess history, if only to demonstrate to ourselves that the African continent is the cradle of human civilization. You know, when Europeans were still living in caves, the Dogon in Mali had already recognized the stars. When the Europeans were still eating raw meat, the Africans had discovered fire. The Africans were the pioneers. And even if you look at all religions and their creation, and I'm a keen reader of the Bible, and the Bible records and the God said, let us create man in our own image. And that he took soil and formed man out of it. The last time I checked, soil was brown or black, not white. <laughs> and I can confirm that I checked this morning. The soil is still black, the soil is still brown. And if, therefore, anybody is created in the image of God, it is we who are of the black race. Islam also says the same thing. And you know, Africa has been abused. When you look at the maps that are drawn by European cartographers, Africa is smaller than the United States of America, and yet it is larger almost as large as Asia, they minimize us at all times. Even the thing they call the Middle East, what is middle about it? How can it be that Israel 
is not part of Africa, but Madagascar is a part of Africa. When we assembled here to talk about decolonization of the mind, we must remind ourselves of our history. The pyramids were made here in Africa. It still defies architecture and engineering. It's the Africans who made them. The walls of Benin, which are four times longer than the Chinese Great Wall, were here in Africa. The temples of Lalibela, which were dug out in Ethiopia out of the soil, were made here in Africa. The great walls of Monomatapa in Zimbabwe were made here in Africa. And when you go to the warriors of the world, the Monis or the Amazons of Dahomey were found in present day Benin. King Zinga of the Mbanda of the Batamba was here in Angola. Africa is the cradle of human civilization. You know, as a young man, I read uh, Ghana's Jody Graft's play, Muntu, in which he says in part, some things we know and some things we do not know. But this one we know, that Odoman Koma created the world, and that Odoman Koma is God. And that God is neither Christian nor Muslim nor all these things because God is a spirit. And if he is a spirit, he cannot be all those things. Your own Desmond Mpilo Tutu writes in a book, God is not a Christian. And he is not. Even for those of us who are of the Christian faith, Christ was not a Christian. Christianity is a post-Christ religion. And you can see that God has been appropriated by civilization. And over the years, they have been whitening God. When God was in the Middle East, even Christ was in the Middle East, he was not as white as he is now presented to us. They took Christ to, Greek, to the Greeks. They made him white. And they made him speak Greek. When they were tired with him, they took him to Rome and they made him speak Latin. And when they had tired with it, they created a religion that they called the Roman Catholic Church. God was not a Catholic and is not a Catholic. When they were tired with him, they took him to England to allow King Henry VIII to marry. And they named the church the Church of England and made the queen and the monarch the head of that church. God is not an Anglican. And when they were tired, they took him to Scotland and they made him a Presbyterian. And when they were tired, they made God a Methodist. And when they were tired, they took him to Germany and they made him a Lutheran. And when they were tired, they went to the United States and they made him an Episcopalian. God is not all those things. The God that I worship is worshipped in truth and in spirit. And let me tell you, throughout the ages, ask yourself a few fundamental questions. Despite the fact that they have done everything to erase Africans from the face of this earth, even in their own history, they acknowledge that all their great men came to Africa. Why? Why? And what did they come to do to Africa? Socrates was in Africa. And when he came to Africa, he met Orunmila of the Yoruba tribe, who was a greater philosopher than him. Pythagoras was in Africa. What did they come to do to Africa? You pay homage where knowledge resides. Moses was in Africa and was born in Africa. What did he come to do in Africa? You pay homage where knowledge is. Muhammad was in Africa. Why do you come to Africa? You pay homage where knowledge is.
Christ or Yeshua was in Africa. Why did he come to Africa? You pay homage where knowledge is. The Lord Krishna of the Hindus was in Africa. Why did he come to Africa? He came to pay homage where knowledge is. This is the cradle of human civilization. But we have been so beaten over the years. We have been so abused over the years. They enslaved us because they feared us. They colonized us because they feared us. They now have a new project, the neo-colonial project. And I'm told that the neo-colonial project is a twin of another child called colonization. Their mother is imperialism. And imperialism never changes its character. It only changes the masks that it wears. We must be wary of it. It is sad. When they came here and abused Christianity, they told us to close our eyes in prayer. And when we opened our eyes, the land had disappeared. That is who they are. They are not our friends. I can still hear through the vicissitudes of time. Your own Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe saying, there is only one race in the world, the human race. But the whites have forgotten that. The Arabs have forgotten that. The Chinese have forgotten that. It is only we, who have, we Africans who know that there is only one race, the human race. It is our duty to remind them that that is indeed the divine instruction. Because the God that I worship cannot be bottled in little religions. The God that I worship cannot be contained in little books. The God that I worship is imminent and omnipresent. <laughs> he is resident in our minds and in our hearts and in our very veins. It is only we who Africans who know him in truth. And in order to appreciate him, we must understand him differently. We must understand him in spirit. You know, when I look at the world, and I look at it often, and when I look at Africa and I look at her often, when I think of Africa and I think of her often, and when I imagine her and I imagine about her often, I say with the famous Sudanese poet Al Faituri, O oh Africa, why hast thou not realized thy potential? And the reason is simple. They came here and did something to our mind and to our spirituality. Many men have tried to understand what they did to us. I'll not refer to all of them, but I'll refer to a dramatization which some of you will be familiar with. The African-American Alex Haley produced a film called Roots. And in Roots, he dramatizes the life of a young man uprooted from Jufure village in what is now known as the Gambia, Kunta Kinte. And they take Kunta Kinte to the United States of America. And when they take Kunta Kinte to the United States of America, the first thing that they do to him is to beat him up that he may change his name so that Kunta Kinte is beaten out of him and they introduce a new being called Toby. That is what they do to us. They beat our Africanness out of us. And when we are all empty, they fill us with something that is alien. And then we begin to think like them. We begin to think that our hair is not good enough. So that our women must buy wigs from dead women. 
in Asia so that our women must reject their skin, they bleach it, that they may become whiter, so that our women can remove their eyebrows and eyelashes, so that our women can paint their lips red. They do that to us. so that our women can stop eating, that they may become slender. They do that to us. And they do that to us because they know that our women are the fountain of life. And that when they change our women, we men who are weak will be changed. We must stop that. We are created in God's image. You know, John Garang de Mabior in Sudan one, once asked the Arabs, why do you want to Arabize us? Why do you want to Islamize us? This God who created us, Nuer, Dinka, Zulu, Kosa, Herero, Nama, Ovambo, Ovimbundu, Ibo, Luo, Agekoyo, Dogon, Wolof, Yoruba, Fulani, Fulfude. Was he stupid? If he is all wise, is he not a god of diversity who wants to be celebrated in different and diverse ways? We must not accept. We must, in the nature of things, change ourselves. You know, just this morning, I was reading the latest work of a great African, Achille Mbembe, from the Dark Knight, Essays in Decolonization. And he says that the only place that we must start decolonizing is the mind because the mind is the standard of the man. I was thinking about the writings of my own countryman, Gugi Wath Yongo, decolonizing the mind. All battles are fought in the mind. Rene Descartes was right because knowledge is universal. Cogito ego sum, I think so I am. So we must think. Because once our minds are changed, then our spirituality is energized. And once our spirituality is energized, then we exercise the ghost of low self-esteem. And once we exercise the ghost of low self-esteem, then we begin to discover our potential. Then our economies begin to grow. Then we mine our gold and improve them. You know... How can it be that Africa is the richest continent on the earth and our gold is mined by the beers? How can it be that Africa is the richest continent on the world and our diamond is produced in South Africa, in Botswana, and Namibia, and in Sierra Leone, and in Liberia, but the price is determined in Antwerp, in Belgium? How can it be? How can it be that Africa produces cocoa in Togo, in Cote d'Ivoire, and in Ghana, and chocolate is then made in Switzerland and in Belgium, who have not even a bush of cocoa? How can it be that tea is, produ is produced in Ethiopia and in Uganda and in Kenya, and when it is taken to the United Kingdom, they now call it English tea? How can it be? How can it be? How can it be? How can it be that Colton is mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but not a single African country makes a mobile phone? How can it be? How can it be? It can only be because we have allowed our minds to be captured. It can only be because we have allowed ourselves to be spiritually confused. It is, can only be 
because we have allowed ourselves to be slaves of others and the God that we worship knowing that we are confused has turned his head on the other side so that when we pray and fast he does not listen or if he listens he does not care he's waiting for us to realize ourselves so that we can worship in truth And you know, this is intergenerational. The pains that are being visited upon this generation are out of the sins that were committed by the other generation. It is a time to repent so that we who have transgressed may say that we have repented because the future now does not lie in us. The future lies in the young ones. Shinwa Achebe was right. These are the young suckers that will grow when the old banana dies. These are the very same upon whose shoulder Africa shall rise. Your duty and my duty is to plant the tree in the knowledge that one generation plants a tree, another generation waters the tree, another generation prunes the tree, another generation enjoys its shade. That is our duty. So this morning, we are not here to say new things. We are only here to remind ourselves that in the beginning there was God and that that God created man and that that man I, ex I suspect was an African and that that man could not have been anything else but an African. Why I suspect so because all creation says that man came from the earth and as I said the earth is either black or brown so in the beginning there was an African and in the beginning there was a spirit into which that mold was made alive and that spirit was God and I suspect that that God gave us intelligence and I suspect that that God created Africa where it is in the very middle because the very middle, the very center is the fulcrum and that is why I suspect Africa is where it is enjoying not too much cold, enjoying not too much sun. It is in the middle. It is indeed life measures as it should be measured. And that is why I suspect in his divine wisdom he put all the minerals in Africa. If it is not gold, it is coltan. If it is not coltan, it is iron ore. If it is not iron ore, it is copper. And he does not stop there. When he was distributing rivers and lakes, he ensured that Africa had the best of lakes, the best of rivers, and he did not stop there. He ensured that we are surrounded with the best of oceans. If it is not the Atlantic, it is the Indian, which should be called the African. I do not know why they call it the Indian Ocean, but that is their conspiracy. Then there is the Mediterranean. They also call it another name, and he did not stop there. Once he had done that, it ensured that this is a continent that has men and women who are so forgiving, so generous. This is the only continent that has welcomed all civilizations. We started with the Arabs. They abused us. Then came the Portuguese. We welcomed them. They abused us. Then the Dutch came. We welcomed them. They abused us. Then the Italians came, we welcomed them, they abused us. Then the Germans came, we welcomed them, they abused us. Then the French came, we welcomed them, they abused us. Then the English came, we welcomed them and they abused us. Then the Indians came, we welcomed them and they abused us. Then the Lebanese came, we welcomed them, they abused us. Now the Chinese are coming, we are welcoming them and they are abusing us. We must stop this. And we can only stop this through self-realization. And that is why when I, can co I conclude, I must conclude by making reference to a great African, Ante Chekdiop of Senegal, 
who writing in his book the human the african origin of humankind myth or reality says this is a problem that can only be solved through aggression and i'm telling us this is the time now for africa to rise africa will be great africa must be great and it will only be great if we choose to spiritually decolonize our minds our hearts and culture because it is only then that Africa will be a great continent. God bless you.